On April 15th, 1912, the unthinkable happened. The unsinkable Titanic hit an iceberg and sank. Uh, for those of you that are younger, maybe you've seen the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio when he was young and Titanic, and it was a great story. But there was really a vessel called the Titanic, and it was billed as being unsinkable. And that was more of a, of a mantra. Uh, but eventually, it, it hit an iceberg and it sank. There are many reasons why they think that took place. A couple of them is this, is that it was moving too fast and it couldn't see the iceberg. Number two, the communications was bad because it was foggy. Nevertheless, the Titanic hit an iceberg. And here's the deal. As it pertains to an iceberg, what is beneath the surface is always worse than what is above. Well, the reality is that Often, you and I, whether if you are a follower of Jesus, uh, whether if you're a brand new follower of Jesus, maybe you're someone who doesn't even follow Jesus and you're exploring, regardless what we tend to do, what we tend to do is we tend to live life on the surface. But just like an iceberg, what is beneath the surface it's much more important. As a matter of fact, every decision that we make is not based on the surface. It's actually based on the inside. Jesus said these words. He says, it's not what goes into a person, but, but it's actually what comes out of them that makes evil. And the reality is this, is because we live on the surface, we don't take time to let Jesus get beneath the surface. And what I mean by getting beneath the surface is this, is we don't allow him to heal our hurts. And so, we, so what we do, just like the Titanic is, is we try to produce and, and we, we try to move fast as though our production is a means of healing what hurts below the surface. We don't take time for him to challenge our thoughts. Here's a big word, teenagers and preteens, it will help you on your SAT, it'll help you in sociology class, cognitive dissonance. A lot of times we live on the surface and Jesus confronts us and he, and he confronts us with a truth. He, he confronts us with something that is contrary to the life that we want to live. And we go, no, no, I'm, I'm good, Lord. Uh, nope, I don't, I don't want to get below that part. And just like the iceberg, eventually, we hit it, we sank like the Titanic. We don't allow him to get beneath the surface and redirect our ambitions. As we start this new series of 2021, it's called Beneath the Surface, and we're going to let Jesus get beneath the surface. We're going to let him graciously transform us, graciously challenge us, graciously make us into new people, and we're going to look at misdirected ambition. So, so what exactly is ambition? Ambition is the strong desire to achieve a goal. Ambition is a strong desire to achieve a goal. And I'm a preacher, I gotta say it three times for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Ambition is the strong desire to achieve a goal. Ambition is a wonderful thing. And what I would say is this, is because every human being is made in the image of God. That doesn't mean God has hands and arms. It means this, that we have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to take what's been created to create. We have the capacity to make choices. We have the capacity to image forth the glory of God. In essence, to be an image bearer of God means this. In the ancient world, wherever a king had a kingdom, there were statues of that king imaging forth his glory. Where we are to be living statues of God's glory, and that's when we're fully alive. So watch this. But because we're all born broken, the Bible calls that we're born spiritually dead. The image of God has not been erased. It's been defaced. And so therefore, our ambitions are misdirected. So we're going to look at how to have ambitions that align with God's heart. But first, um, let's use an example, and I want to encourage you. This is so, so important. I know that there are some of you watching, and you are racked with guilt. You are racked with shame. 
you are racked with, I have an accomplishment. And there's a whole bunch of things that are going on. And I just want you to just to, just to, just to come through the fog. And I want you to meet Jesus because Jesus has a history of using messed up people. As a matter of fact, if Jesus didn't use messed up people, the only person he would have used is himself. At the foot of the cross, all of us are in need of grace. So if you feel damaged, if you feel messed up, if you feel like you haven't accomplished much, if you're wracked with guilt and shame and brokenness, guess what? You are a perfect candidate for the grace of God. Now, I wanna take you back old school. I wanna take you back to the formation of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is God's chosen people to be a light to the world so that the people could see what life and love with God looks like. God worked through a man by the name of Abram. He changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many. God has always, when I say God, I mean Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit, the God of the Bible, has always wanted a family. And this is the thing, he doesn't say family, you have to work to me. He says, family, I'm coming down to you. Family, you don't have to fix yourself. Family, I'm gonna fix you. That's what a good, good father does. A good, good father does for his children what they can't do for themselves. That's called grace. At the end of the day, there are two religions in the world. What you do to be acceptable to God or what God has done to make you acceptable to him. So in the early formation of the nation of Israel, God's people find themselves in slavery in Africa, in Egypt. There was a very, very wise woman, and by the way, I pray that the women of Transformation Church would be like Moses' mom. She, she, she worshiped God, and therefore she had God's wisdom. And what the Pharaoh was doing is he was aborting and slaughtering Hebrew babies that were born because there were just too many of them and he didn't want to lose his power base. Moses' mom, who is wise and shrewd, puts Moses in a basket where she knows that Pharaoh's daughter will be bathing. So watch this. The name Moses means to draw out. So Moses was put in a basket, floated down the River, his sister Miriam was running side by side. God had a plan, running side by side. It looked bleak, but God makes a way when it seems like there's no way. Pharaoh's daughter sees this beautiful Hebrew boy in a basket. Moses draws him out. <laughs> Moses' sister's like, hey, uh, I will get this baby's mom to take care of him. So long story short, Moses, who went from about to be aborted, all of a sudden grows up in Pharaoh's palace. So he's a Hebrew growing up with the privilege of the Egyptian oppressors. But young Moses, as he grows up, is an example of misdirected ambition. Watch this. Years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observe their forced labor. So let's note, notice this. Moses is growing up in a palace. He's wealthy. He's got privilege. He's in the dominant group and he grows up and he goes out and goes, oh my gosh, look at my Hebrew people suffering. Really quick, this ain't a part of the sermon, but please don't neglect suffering because you got it made. The goal is not simply for you to get yours. The goal is not simply for you to get the houses, the cars, and the stuff. The goal is to use your position and platform to be the hands and feet of God. There's a hurting world, and God is not just calling you to hoard. He's calling us to be generous and gracious, and look what Moses does. And so right now, Moses is doing a good thing. And watch the misdirected ambition. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his people. So there's tension there. Now watch what he does. Looking all around, so the ambition is good, the slavery's bad, he, he wants to free his people, but he's gonna do it in his own power. Looking all around and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. That's misdirected ambition. He had a great goal, but his ambition was misdirected because it was not directed in the power of God. 
Family, let me give you an example. This is really important. Notice what Moses does. He, he strikes the Egyptian dead and he hides him in the sand. So Moses, boom, kills him. And then he gets a shovel and he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide this. And what happens? The next day, Moses goes out amongst his Hebrews. He sees some Hebrews arguing and he tells them to stop. And his own people are like, so who are you to tell us to stop? We've seen you kill the Egyptian. Pharaoh finds out, and Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness learning to direct his ambition in alignment with God. But before he did, he buried his sin in the sand. And trans Transformation Church, and to our guests, 2021, we're not gonna bury our sin in the sand anymore. For those of you, for many of us, you're following G G Jesus and you know that there are things out of alignment with your life and God's. There are things out of alignment re relationally, financially, socially, and, and you're going, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and bury it. It's okay, it's okay, I'm just gonna bury it. Can I let you know? You have to bury your sins, not in the sand, but in the cross. Of course, God will discipline us, but the discipline of God is so much better than the hand of Satan. Don't bury your sin in the sand. Bury it in the sun. Look what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, in other words, we have a gracious dad, and when we go, God, what I've done, I'm wrong, I, I, I'm sorry. I was inconsistent. I was out of alignment with your will and your heart. He is faithful. You know why Jesus is faithful? Because you're not and I'm not and righteous. You know why God is faithful and righteous? Because I'm not righteous and you're not righteous. And so Jesus has to be our righteousness. All of us are looking for affirmation, but affirmation cannot be found in what we do. Affirmation is found in the one who is faithful and righteous. His righteousness becomes ours. What does he do? To forgive us of our sins, past, present, future, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So no more burying our sins in the sand. Let's bury our sins in the son who is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So teenagers and preteens, how do you know if your ambition is misdirected? So uh, this particular instrument here, I believe is called a leveler. Now listen, if something's broke at the gray house, Vicki Gray fixes it. I'm not ashamed to admit I can't fix nothing except for my rod and reels and those types of things. But what I do know is this leveler here, if you wanna make sure something is even, right, you put this on top of it and this little water thing gets right in the middle and it shows you that it is level with whatever it is you're trying to get level. Well, a lot of times our lives are like this or like that and they're not level and God is saying, no, 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 come and put your ambitious in align with me. Put your relationships in align with me. Put your finances in align with me. Put your desires and ambitions in align with mine because when you're aligned to the assignment, that's where we flourish. That doesn't mean a life of ease. It means a life of participating in the goodness and the grace of God. Now let me pause here. One of the questions that I get often particularly by followers of Christ in their early 20s or in high school, maybe even early, early 30s, or then when they get to midlife crisis, mid 40s, early 50s, the question is this, what does God want me to do? What is God's will? And I go, I'll tell you what God's will is. You ready? Move in, move in, here it is. Number one, let him love you. If God's love is not enough, no accomplishment you conquer will ever be enough. So, so, so you let him love you. 
And then number two, you, you begin to grow in loving yourself, which means humility and you don't live with game and uh, uh, shame and guilt and, and you let God deal with your trauma. Understand this, your job can't fix your hurts. Your spouse can't fix your hurts. Your ambitions and goals can't fix your hurts. So, so you begin to let God heal, heal you, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you happen to fly planes, do that as a pilot. If you happen to be an administrator at a school, administrate. If you happen to be a CrossFit instructor, be a CrossFit instructor and upward, inward, outward. Love God, love self, love na- na- neighbor. God's will for your life is to let him love you so you can love yourself and to love others through the unique talents and gifts he's given you and his will also is one day to heal the entire universe and to make a new heavens and a new earth and as we're loving, we participate in that. God's will is not X marks the spot. Years ago, I was preaching at an event for pastors and before I got up to speak, there was this... uh, introduction, and it was like, you're made for this, like you're made for pastoring. And my first line of my talk was, you're not created to be pastors. So I got up there like, man, how's this going to work? Well, I got to tell the truth, or there ain't no reason for me to be here. So I got up and I, I, I said, respectfully, none of us in here are made to be pastors. Pastoring is something that we do. It's not who we are. We are made to be beloved children of God who are treasured by their daddy, who express that gifting and that love through the gift of pastoring. But you can do that in any form or capacity. You don't have to work vocationally as a church, at a church to be a quote-unquote pastor. The word pastor simply means to shepherd, to care for people. We need people in the business world and the education and government that do those things. So understand, we're not made for certain vocations. We are made for the vocation of God of loving us, and that's expressed in a whole bunch of ways. Teenagers, I want you to chill out. College students, I want you to chill out. I can take you to my house and show you old interviews where I said, I wanna be an athletic director. Am I an athletic director? Have I ever been an athletic director? Nope. So what's my point? Trust the Lord. Let him lead you. You can trust him. Don't worry so much about what he wants you to do vocationally because if you're allowing him to soak you and saturate you in his love, you'll walk right into it. Does your ambition or my ambition point to you or to Jesus? That's tricky, because we can deceive ourselves. We can really, really deceive ourselves. Can I give you an example of when I deceived myself? It was early in the history of Transformation Church. We're meeting in a little warehouse in Indian land. Uh, It was once a baseball training facility. Uh, We had two services. I would vision cast, God is gonna do great things. We're gonna be at three services and four services and five services. And eventually, we were up to six services. And I thought, man, I'm only 43, 44. Man, I'm played in the NFL. I'm gonna preach all six services. You know why? Because I wanna see God glorified. So my ambition was right but it was misaligned because on the inside, beneath the surface, I was afraid that if I didn't preach six services, that people would leave because they didn't want preaching on video. So you know what I I did? I want God to be glorified, which I did, but I just didn't trust him to do it. So I thought, well, I'll preach six services until after Easter, and then we'll go back to five. That about tore me down physically, emotionally, mentally. It was too much. It wasn't like, I want people to see me. It was like, I want to help God. But the problem is, God don't need my help. I need his help. God don't need your help. You need his help. And isn't it ironic that now, through video preaching, we're reaching exponentially more people around the world. So what's my point? 
It's kind of like Moses. Like I had good ambition, but it was misdirected because of fear. Just like the song our worship team sing, I will trust in you. God can accomplish infinitely more than we can ever accomplish. He just wants us to understand that, to participate, but not try to help him. He doesn't need our help. We need his help. So watch this. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Can you imagine how different the world would be? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. And maybe you're saying, well, pastor, how do I know if it's ambition or selfish? Like, like how do I know? Um, well, here's one of the ways that you can know. Do other people's lives get better as a result? Are people pointed to Jesus as a result? It, here's a way that you can pray for me. Um, th- these, are, these are my ambitions. I, I wanna be a man that loves the Father, the Son, and the Spirit more than anything else in the universe. That's my number one ambition. Pray that for me. I, I wanna fight for the heart of my wife and children, and it's a fight. We are in a spiritual battle. We don't fight with our spouse. We don't fight with our kids. We fight for our spouse and for our kids. What does that mean? It means trusting God to continually to learn how to love and how to trust him to minister in me and through me to them. Thirdly, oh, well, this is when we went to Norway, and from this picture, uh, you can get a, a sense of our family's vibe. So athletic, 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 supermodel. I mean, she, I mean, we out in the woods and, and Presley got on boots up to her knees. Got to love her. Like we took some exceptional pictures, but that's how our family rolls. But, but that's my ambition right there. And as your children become adults, right, we're not responsible for their behavior. We're simply responsible to them. Uh, I want to lead and serve the people of Transformation Church in such a way that Jesus is made famous through us in remarkable ways, individually, collectively. And one day we will be able to meet again. Until then, we are not gonna waste this pandemic. We're gonna worship at home. We're gonna be the priests of our home when we worship together corporately. And when Monday through Saturday, this is a time of deepening our, our, our roots into the soil of God's great love. We're not gonna waste this moment. We're gonna grow from this moment just like a trampoline. You gotta go down before you go up. And the beauty is this, we're going down deeper in God's grace and we're coming up higher in his grace. I want to help create thousands of gospel-shaped multi-ethnic churches in America and the world. One of the ways that we're do- doing this is through the HD Leader Round Table. So no, your prayers, your generosity, your faithfulness as a congregation is bigger than just you. One of our goals as pastors and leaders and ministry leaders of Transformation Church is to get us to understand that salvation is more than me, Jesus, and my Bible. Salvation is God has a family. He forgives sins. We're brothers and sisters of different colored skins. And the goal is not simply you get better. The goal is God makes us better to be better into the world. The way the Bible describes that is let your light so shine that your good works may glorify your Father in heaven. Let me put it to you in the Derwin Gray translation. Let your life be soaked in the love of God so much so that love radiates from you, not because you're trying, but because you're dying and he's living in us and he's living through us. How do we tell if our ambitions are in alignment with the Lord's? How do we do it? Does your ambition value people? Does your ambitions value human beings? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. So, so does your ambition, let's just say all the stars align and, and, and everything goes the way it's supposed to go and your ambitions get fulfilled, is that gonna make other people go, man, 
as a result of what they're doing, I feel more valued. Now, understand this. Some of you are going, well, Derwin, I work in a corporate America. Don't let the culture influence you. Jesus has you there to influence the culture. Influence how you give loans. Influence how you do law. Influence how you do policing. Influence how you do teaching. Influence how you do everything that you do. We are to be transformed from the inside, not conformed from the outside. So your job cannot dictate to you how you present value to other human beings. Let me give you an example. I'm not going to use a name here because they're not paying me any royalties, but there's a particular fast food restaurant that does not open on Sunday, and there is a qualitative difference in how their servers are compared to other fast food restaurants. Why is that? Their training says we value people. Listen, When you value people, God will take care of what you value because what you value will be what he values. And God values people. How do we know? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. This is the incarnation. We just celebrated Christmas. That Jesus, the eternal son of God, stepped down, that God's glory came to earth Jesus looking in the mirror is God the Father looking at himself through Christ. Jesus is the human face of God. Have you ever heard the song, What If God Was One of Us? Well, guess what? He was. That's called the incarnation. Heaven and earth met in Jesus. 100% God, 100% man. The theanthros, theanthropic nature, the God-man. Watch this. And through him, to reconcile everything to himself. That which is divorced, he wants to bring together. So all those who trust in him, all those who say, Jesus, forgive my sin. I give my life to you. He reconciles us to his daddy. He restores us unto our true humanity, and he gives us the capacity to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters. Where the things on heaven and or things whether things on earth or things in heaven, this is what this means, is that one day all unrights will be made wrong, uh, or all rights, all things that are wrong will be made right, all things that are sad will become untrue, there will be no more tears and no more death. That's called the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus comes back to earth to restore. So how does he do this, though? by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I've been saying this for almost 11 years and I'll continue to say it. And I'm gonna have a little mini fit. If the cross of Christ only forgives your sin but does not affect racism, that cross is too small. If the cross of Christ only forgives your sin but does not affect your greed, that cross is too small. If the cross of Christ does not affect your misogyny, then the cross is too small. The cross of Christ transforms life because there's nothing like the blood of Jesus and all it takes is one drop that when that blood gets in you, it is a holy transfusion. It is a holy transformation that affects every single aspect of our being, even the universe itself. Romans 8, is saying, we long for redemption. Don't minimize the blood of Jesus to simply a one-way ticket to heaven when you die. The blood of Jesus rains down heaven on earth through people who've been soaked in his blood. That's what it says. I ain't making this up. It's been there for 2,000 years. It's right there. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. What does mature in Christ look like? It looks like love. Paul says, I labor for this, striving with a strength that works powerfully in me that our ambition, whatever it is, needs to be in alignment with this. So whether if you're a teacher, whether if you are 
a stockbroker, insurance salesperson, whatever it may be, government official, whatever it is. If you follow Jesus, here's the operating chip inside of you. Here's the operating program inside of you. It is that we are proclaiming him. We, we don't go to work with a Bible and stand on your desk, okay? That's that, no, 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 no. Be a Bible instead. <laughs> that's how my wife came to faith. It was a woman at work and, and, and she admired the godliness. She didn't, my wife didn't even know what she was saying other than this is a good woman. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, do you think God just has you at your job just so you can pay bills? I mean, do we think so small of him? No. But notice what Paul says here. I labor for this striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. I love that. Striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. Does your ambition my ambition, look out for the interest of others. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. Wow. This is challenging, and here's why. Regardless if you're a follower of Christ or not, um, a scarcity mentality is very hard to overcome. A scarcity mentality is I have to get more. It doesn't matter how much you already have or how little you have. The scarcity mentality is I have to get mine because there's not enough at the table for everyone to eat. So that doesn't matter if you're wealthy or whether it matter if you're poor. It's a state of the heart. And it says, Pastor, if I live looking out for others, Who's going to look out for me? Who's going to look out for me? I get it. Well, I want to encourage you with this. The first thing is this. Just as we sing the worship song, I trust you, uh, we begin to learn how to trust God that he's going to meet our needs, not our greeds, he's gonna meet our needs. And some of you are gifted as such. You've got five talents. You're gonna be incredibly wealthy. Some of you are not, and that's okay. Just be the best version that God has called you to be, aligning your ambitions to his. The issue is stewarding what God has given me, and the issue is having a generous mentality instead of a scarcity mentality. mentality. A scarcity mentality says, I can't celebrate what anybody else does because that takes shine from, from me. Mentali- a, a scarcity men- mentality says, I can't develop and train because those people may end up being better than me. Scarcity mentality says, well, pastor, I can't do that 10% tithe thing because I got bills to pay or whatever it simply may be. And I want to get you to understand this, that we have a good, good father. And this is what he says through his good, good son. He says, but, but what? In verses 25 to 32, here's what's happening. Jesus is telling the Jewish disciples and he's telling us, hey, You see the birds? Man, they ain't worrying about it. And the Father provides for them. Aren't you more important than birds? Hey, don't don't worry about what you're going to eat or don't worry about what you're going to wear. God is going to provide. Well, some of you go, well, Derwin, what happens when God doesn't provide? My question is this, is how stingy are we in the church that there are people in our church community that we're not helping? The way God provides is he uses people. Hello. Our excess is someone else's blessing. Our abundance meets someone else's need. But, here comes one of them big butts. God loves big butts and he cannot lie. Satan may try to deny, but here it is. Here's how we level our ambitions regardless of what you do. Here's how we level alignment to assignment. Here's how we do it. But seek First, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? That's a great question. Let's make it really simple. The kingdom of God looks like Jesus. 
The kingdom of God looks like Jesus. The way Jesus forgave, the way Jesus healed, the way Jesus loved, the way Jesus embodied truth, the way Jesus loved his daddy, the way Jesus loved people, the way Jesus went to the cross, the way Jesus rose again. The kingdom of God looks like Jesus. In other words, seek Jesus above all, that he is the great treasure that we can possess. That's how we ultimately align our assignments. Here's a prayer that God will answer undoubtedly. God, I want more of Jesus and watch what he does. Now, I don't know how that's gonna happen in your life. I know how it happened in my life. Ankles start getting hurt, knees start getting hurt, start not liking playing football. My last year in the NFL, I got hurt, couldn't even play. So you know what I did? They paid me like a half million dollars to sit in a cold tub and read the Bible for four months. And I was just mad. I'm reading the Bible, just mad. Why did God do this to me? Of course, God didn't do it to me. A player for the Dallas Cowboys actually did it to me. And I'm just mad. I'm reading the Bible. And after those four months, I'm like, man, I really love Jesus more. Wait a second. The Carolina Panthers basically paid me to rehab my knee and read the Bible so I can fall in love with Jesus. And in the meantime, I began sharing my faith with teammates and coaches. Well, how about that? I I just, I'm not sure how God's gonna do it in your life, but what he does do is there are things that we're holding on to that, 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 that has our alignment misbalanced, our ambitions, and what he does is sometimes he's gotta go, and you're going, no, and he's going, nah, come on, come on, come on. And you're going, oh, don't take it, and then he gives you something more himself, and you go, why did I wait so long? Today's the day. There's no need to wait so long. But seek first the kingdom of God and his Righteousness, this Greek word means his justice. What is justice? Justice is loving your neighbor as you love yourself. If something is hurting in someone else's life because you love your neighbors, you love yourself, you don't want them to hurt, you want to be a healer. That's all justice means. Justice is loving your neighbor going public. And all these things will be provided for you. We don't have to have a scarcity mentality because God in his grace will provide our needs and not our greeds. Aligning our ambitions. Your gifts and my gifts. Your gifts and passions are the vehicle by which Jesus delivers his grace to the world. There's no such thing. Here comes a big word. There's no such thing as the secular sacred divide. The word secular simply means without God. All of life is worship. Your schooling, everything. And your gifts and passions are the vehicle how God delivers his grace to the world. So he wants your ambitions and my ambitions to line up to his so that we can flourish, but also that the world can see him. Let me give you an example. Question, when you think of the Uh, the Apostle Paul, for those of you who have followed Christ and you know him, when you think of him, do you just see him like sitting at a Starbucks with like a bunch of Torah scrolls and the Torah of Isaiah and Jeremiah? Or, 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 Or do you see him as a business entrepreneur? Well, let's take a look. Acts chapter 18, one through four. And by the way, I've been reading Acts uh, a couple times a year for the last few years because one, one year we're just gonna go all through the book of Acts. It is riveting. I'm not sure when that's gonna be, but I'm in prep mode. So watch, watch this. After this, he left Athens. This is Paul. He left Athens and went to Corinth where he found a Jew named Aquila. There's the Bible again talking about race. Gosh, that, that's a joke for when people go, Pastor, why do you talk about race so much? Because it's in the Bible and God came to save the human race from killing each other. Moving on. Where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius 
had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Okay, side note, I got to teach. I'm going to see a Zogian here. In AD 49, Emperor Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. You, you know why? Because the Jews had come back from Jerusalem over the years, and they went into the synagogues, and they were like, Jesus is the Messiah. There were brawls, there were riots, and Claudius said, get out of here. And when all the Jews left Rome, guess what happened? The Gentiles, the non-Jews, began to take over the house churches at Rome, and guess what happened? The Apostle Paul wrote a letter called the Book of Romans. Okay, that was fun. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. From Italy with Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. And since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade. Now, when you think tent, don't think little tents. Think of a tent that covered a Colosseum. It's huge. Paul was a businessman and entrepreneur. He used his job of tent making to make disciples and lead people to Christ. He stayed with him and worked. He stayed with him and went to Starbucks all day. He stayed with him and studied all day. No, he worked with them. It was at his job that people came to faith. He reasoned in a synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade just Jews because he only wanted to reach Jews. Huh, Jews and Greeks. Wow, there's the Bible talking about race again. It talks about race so much, why? Because God wants to redeem the human race to create a family of brothers and sisters with different colored skins because the kingdom of God wins. And when we love each other, Jesus says the world will know that you are my disciples. So if you are a business person, if you're in the marketplace, man, your job is paying you to be a missionary. This is what's gonna happen here. Uh, KJ and the crew are gonna come back out and they're gonna sing. And I want you to allow the words of the songs, the beauty of the music, the power of the spirit to begin to reveal to you where your ambitions are a little off and say, Lord, I want you to put my ambitions in alignment with yours. And after they're done, I'm gonna come back out. God, our desires for our, our lives to bring glory to your name. Let's sing this again.
I want to speak to those of you right now that are watching. And you know that there are things that you have buried in thought you are hiding. Um, that there are sins that, that you thought you were hiding and burying, but the reality is, is they're burying you emotionally. Uh, unforgiveness affects our mental health, our physical health, our relational health, but not just with people, but with the Lord. So, so I wanna talk to those of you. Uh, maybe you're a person that you've gone to church for years, maybe not consistently, and you know, hey, I'm American, I, I'm a Christian, but something happened as you were listening to this message that the Holy Spirit engaged you at another level to say, no, 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 you've been like a kid at a candy store looking inside, but you haven't come inside. Well, Jesus has opened the door and he's wanting you to leave the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of light. He's, he's wanting you to move from burying your sins in the sand to burying your sins on the cross where he is faithful, where he is just, where, where he is righteous, to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And, and there's some of you, you don't even know what happened other than, oh my goodness, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to surrender my life to him. You may be a teenager. You may be in your 60s. You may be in your 50s. Jesus is speaking to you right now. And he's saying, you don't have to hide anymore. Besides, it's not hiding anything. It's lived out. Would you let Jesus make you new today? We started a new year, 2021. Well, God wants to give you a new eternity. God wants to give you life eternal that doesn't begin when you die, but begins when you say yes, you move from death to life. Today is your day. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling you home. Jesus is saying, will you let me love you? Would, me, would, you, would you let me turn your hurts into scars of victory? Would you let me take what was done wrong to you to make you stronger than you ever thought you would be? Jesus is saying, give me your ambitions and I'll give you a life you never ever thought was possible. Huh, I wanted to be an athletic director. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Just say this to him, he's listening, he's present. Lord Jesus, I, I've tried to bury my junk, my sin, the things I'm ashamed of. I've tried to bury them in the sand. I thought I was hiding them, but I'm not. Today, I am ready to have a new life. Today, I am ready to be loved by you. Today, I'm ready to become a new creation. Today, I'm ready to experience the one who is faithful and righteous, to forgive me of all my sins and to cleanse me and to make me new, to make me whole. Right where you are, say this to him. Today, Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you died and that you rose again to forever forgive me to give me a new life in your kingdom. And today I give you my allegiance because you gave me your life. I say yes to you, King Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Our soul tattoo is this. Ask the Holy Spirit to align your ambitions to his. Ambitions are a good thing. I think KJ, didn't you write a song like Misdirected Ambitions or something? That's probably where I got the sermon from. What did you say? Ambition without direction will lead you to destruction. That, what he said right there. <laughs> Ambition without direction will lead you to destruction. I've been trying to tell y'all that for 45 <laughs> minutes. 
So let's, let's, he said it in three seconds. I said it took 45 minutes. So, but let's let the Holy Spirit do that in us and through us. Jesus is worth it. And what I want us to do for our action step is uh, I want you to check out this series called The Chosen. It's like an app that you download, The Chosen, and it's about the life and story of Jesus. And, and it's really unique how it's done in the acting and the cultural context. And you guys know I cry all the time anyway, but I literally cried through the first season, man. I probably lost 10 pounds of tears. It was just so moving and so beautiful. And I think it would be great. It's a great way to start the new year. And, and then read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you're watching The Chosen. We want to immerse ourselves in Jesus. Now, before our campus host comes, um, I want you, if you're watching by TV, uh, I want you to fill out the connection card. Our QR code is going to come up. If you're on other devices, it comes up another way. But for those of you watching on TV, the QR code is going to come up. Open up your camera app and point your phone at it, and it's going to give you a connection card, all right? So if you prayed with me to receive Christ, fill that card out for us. Why? That's so important. It's important, number one, we want to celebrate with you. We want to pray for you. Number two, we want to connect with you and to begin to help you grow in this new life. You know why? Because God has given you ambitions and you matter and he wants to align them to the assignment so that you can flourish as his beauty and his glory is translated through your life. So fill that out, connect with us. We want to serve you the best way possible.